challenge of cutting this inside within the tunnels with megalithic blocks that weighs tens of pounds and an elephant. So we know we calculated a block that weighs 50 pounds we were in at least 2,000 men yeah. And there is no space. Power box installed over here. So it was going to be, it was going to make all the difference to what we see here was not the bedrock because it can accomplish lots of work in the open with the right amount of people. Because to gather 2,000 people to drag a block of stone is not an impossible job. But to have this done inside the tunnel, that's crazy. So are all these in their original places? Yeah. Yeah. Now yeah. so we know this is here. So we can see here one of the boxes in the Sarapio, rough, with the rough surface. If we follow the Egyptological way of polishing this one, then we will be having few men with sand and rocks polishing the surface. If this works anyway, there's still no space for these men to work. So when we see the other ones also inside the chambers that's finished, hmm? mm -hmm. how would this be finished if you don't have space for the people to be working around? Basic and simple question. So here, Yosef, is one where the lid has been slid back. Yeah. And again, it's believed that the boxes themselves weigh how much? 70 ton for the box and 30 ton for the lid. So the total of 100 ton for the box and the lid in the range. Of. And this is not local stone? No, this is not local stone. Where was it brought from, do you think? Not closer than Aswan, which is 1,000 kilometers from here. Well, as you've heard Yusuf say, the box and the lid, of which there are more than 20 of them, each one in its recess, weighs about 100 tons. The stone is from at least 1,000 kilometers away, and yet the official statement is that these were made during dynastic times, the late period, as burials for sacred bulls, the Apis bull. However, the level of tolerance and engineering and finish in this incredibly hard stone, which the dynastic Egyptians did not have the tools to shape it, tells us that we're looking at an older construction than what Egyptologists say from probably several thousand years ago. And the only way that these boxes were quarried, moved, and put into place underground here and finished would have been using forms of technology that not only the ancient dynastic Egyptians did not have, but that we also do not have to this day because engineer Chris Dunn, author of books such as the Giza Power Plant, asked a firm in the United States if they could replicate one of these out of one piece. And they said, no. We require four pieces for the sides, one piece for the bottom, and another piece for the lid. So with 21st century technology, even with an unlimited budget, we cannot achieve this today. We don't talk about much. Uh -huh. We see this, the tunnel itself, is right. all carved in the bedrock. Right. So imagine if we turned off this light now, we're not going to be even able to see our palms right ahead of us. Right. So imagine that you are actually doing this, the challenge of this work in the dark. How are you going to, what are you going to be using? A flame? There is no even markings of any of this in dark. There, and there are no openings in the ceiling. Again, if you're doing this work in the open, uh -huh. it was going to be much more, less challenging dragging, if we're going to be dragging these megalithic boxes, at least the box without the lid is 50 tons. And you need around 2,000 men 
to drag this 50 tons, okay? And if we looked at the width of the tunnel, uh -huh. it's maximum two feet wider than the width of the box. Like the one we see here. Hmm? Yeah. And we already measured that before. So there is actually no space for even 500 people or uh, 200 people to be there and doing the dragging part. And also lowering the box down exactly. into it. Exactly. That it's housed in lower level, that's another challenge. Right. Because now you have to turn with it and then take it in a lower level. And we can see it's almost perfect, the space from all sides. Hmm? Yeah. And there used to be other devices, I believe, in this place, which we can see that they were, there, was the, there is a carving in the wall to house something else. I believe it could be a false door, or what we know as the false door, which is another device that can possibly regulate frequency and sound, or create standing waves and controlling also the wavelength of, frequent, of sound frequency. Mm -hmm. So, the only reason again and again that we date and relate and identify these boxes is according to the writings on it. Mm -hmm. And in here in this case, we find maximum three boxes with writings on them and more than 20 ones plain without writings. Right. And the one that the officials believe it's the most valuable one because it contains most of the writings has the worst writing example that you can see, especially when you compare it with the surface of high-tech machining like the one we see. What Yusuf is saying and what we'll see in uh, this next segment is the fact that the quality of the finished surface of the box itself is far superior to the actual writing or hieroglyphics on the surface. Many archaeologists believe that the surface itself, the shaping of the box and the fine surface are contemporary with the writings, but that makes absolutely no sense because the writing is inferior and if they had the technology to be able to do the cutting, moving, shaping and finishing of the box then they would have had the capability of ele elegant and eloquent carving of the hieroglyphics and that's not the case. So clearly what you're looking at is you're looking at a super ancient series of these boxes and later uh, they were discovered by the dynastic Egyptians in situ, underground here, and the dynastic Egyptians carved the hieroglyphs on the surface. This is an example of recycling, of one culture creating something, and another culture coming and adding their part to it. So this is where Yusuf is going to show us the difference between the surface of the box itself and the quality of the carving. Well, it really, Brian, doesn't require a professional to realize the difference between how sharp the cuts are and the surface is and how crude the writings are. Because in, in cases like what we see over here, for example, this is a marking of a primitive tool that could not even create a straight line on the surface. Right. That's so clear. It doesn't require even a professional in machining to see the difference in these surfaces. Look at that fee here, for example, there's a point here when the tool slid over because it was not sh sharp enough even to scratch the surface uh -huh. right here. That okay. will happen when you use a, 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 a tool that's not solid enough to conquer the surface of cyanide here. And the other mystery we see here, how this was polished. Uh -huh. You see, the first time I looked at that, I saw many bent area like this yet it received that extreme polishing. Right. So it didn't make sense because if you are polishing following the theory of Egyptologists that this would be polished by sand and a piece of quartz or a piece of diorite with water, then how can he fit this, this polish into the deeper parts that we see like this one here? So uh -huh. there had to be something else. And then when we looked close, we realized the fact this was not polished the surface here was not polished, that shiny surface was not polished by sand and water. It was polished by an alchemy formula of some kind, that it was once a liquid. 
uh -huh. this liquid was cased to the box and then as any liquid it will come down to the bottom of the lid like what we see here ah. and create drops coming ah. down right if we if you followed here is a clear one yeah this clearly was a liquid and we see the marking of the liquid running in the bottom of the lid gives exactly the same shiny surface like here but not deeper where that liquid didn't go ah. so this is the smooth surface by the machining and this is the polished surface by the liquid and there is no process of sand and water and a piece of rock to polish this is a ridiculous theory because here we can see a clear evidence that it was an alchemy formula that they made probably acid with something else so as you can see this is a, a classic example of the things that we're trying to look at not only here in Egypt but also in places like Peru and Bolivia you have a standard archaeological explanation for the function of something which when an engineer and or stonemason looks at, at it they say there's no way there's no way that the dynastic Egyptians with copper or bronze chisels and stone hammers could have achieved what we're looking at and therefore uh, the Greeks afterwards couldn't have done it the Romans afterwards couldn't have done it the Islamic people after that couldn't have done it 21st century technology can't do it we have no choice but to look farther back in time and look for a, a civilization that had lost ancient high technology superior to what we have today.